Hey guys, welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through observation of the wrist and the hand. We're going to be breaking down your observation into an anterior, posterior, radial and ulna view, and we're going to be highlighting key traits and common pathologies in each of these views. So as to not slow your video down, we're not going to be comparing the right and left sides in this video, but of course in clinical practice we always want you to compare the two to clarify your clinical diagnosis. But before we go into our observation, a quick note on inflammatory signs and bony deformity, because no matter what joint you're observing, it's always important to consider these things and the wrist is absolutely no exception. And just in case you've forgotten, the key three inflammatory signs are redness, swelling and bruising. So there are five key presentations in which you are highly likely to find inflammatory signs that every good clinician should be aware of. Number one is a trauma. With any trauma, your patient may suffer bony or soft tissue injury, such as a fracture or a ruptured muscle. Expect to find either swelling, bruising or deformity when observing the joint. For more severe cases, you may find more than one of these signs present. Number two is a bursitis which put simply is inflammation of a bursa. Some bursae are more easily seen when they are inflamed. For instance, elecronon bursitis, or student's elbow, can be easily visualized as the bursa is right beneath the subcutaneous layer of the skin. Others are not so easily visualized due to their anatomy. For instance, subacromial bursitis, where the bursa in question lies in a relatively deep position underneath the acromion. The amount of swelling seen therefore varies based on the anatomical site and the severity of inflammation. In the event of a bursitis, you may see redness on the skin and feel warmth on palpation. Always consider whether this could have been caused mechanically or whether an infection is responsible, in which case your patient may be systemically unwell. Number three is a tendonitis. When you look at the tendon in question, your patient may get swelling and redness in the most severe forms. Be aware though, don't rule out tendonitis if these signs are not present. You should also rely on your objective tests and mechanical signs. Number four is an infection or a cellulitis, where you may find redness or swelling, or in progressed cases even pus in the area of infection. Furthermore, look at your patient as a whole. Do they feel unwell? Or do they have a temperature? Finally, number five is arthropathies, which can be categorized into osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and crystal arthritis. For osteoarthritis, you may expect to find an enlarged swollen joint, and in progressed cases, you may find hard swelling when you palpate the joint. With rheumatoid arthritis, you may find redness or swelling at the joint you are assessing, as well as other joints, particularly the hands and the feet. The onset of rheumatoid arthritis is insidious, so if your patient history indicates an absence of trauma, this should be considered a potential pathology. If you suspect this condition, you may wish to liaise with your patient's GP to conduct blood tests to rule out raised inflammatory markers. Crystal arthropathies represent a group of conditions associated with the deposition of mineralized material, mimicking crystals within joints and surrounding tissues. Gout and pseudogout are some of the most recognizable forms. These conditions present typically in a single large joint with redness and swelling and may well be warm to palpate. Like with rheumatoid arthritis, the important things to bear in mind are whether or not the onset of symptoms can be linked to a mechanical cause and whether mechanical aggravating or easing factors can be associated with a patient's symptoms. If not, a crystal arthropathy should be considered and the patient should consult with their GP for further investigation. So those are our inflammatory signs. Let's get into the main video. So now we're going to complete our observation of our patient's wrist and hand in an anterior view. And for the purpose of this video, as it's easier for you guys to see, we're going to be doing most of our observation on our patient's right hand. Of course, in clinical practice, you're going to be comparing it to the left as well. So the first thing we're going to do is have a global scan for our inflammatory signs of redness, swelling and bruising, as well as bony deformity. Um, in particular, for example, if your patient walks in saying, oh, I actually I had a fall yesterday um, and I, I fell onto my outstretched hand and I haven't had the chance to have it x-rayed, 
um, and you see significant swelling or redness in the area, it may be a possible sign of a fracture. The next thing we're going to do is observe the thena and hypothena eminence of the hand, as this is where we have local intrinsic muscles located. Uh, we're going to look for two particular things when we consider these areas. One is a wasting and two is a swelling. So let's go through the wasting. So if your patient presents with significant atrophy of the muscles in either the thena or hypothena eminence, this may be due to a nerve palsy. So if your patient comes in and, and has this wasting and also says, oh, actually, I, I, I've noticed there's a lot less strength in my hand, it's really weak, or I've lost dexterity, or I've lost function in my hand, it might be due to a nerve palsy. If that is the case, we need to be very um, quick with our consideration of onward referral, um, perhaps to a neurologist um, or an extended scope practitioner to order some nerve conduction studies. It is a very urgent matter if you see this. The other thing we were looking for, as we said, is a swelling, and this may be due to irritation or overactivity of muscles, uh, particularly in the thena eminence, where the muscles for some, some of the uh, thumb muscles are located. So, for example, if you have a patient who's, let's say, right-handed, and they're texting on their mobile phone all day, and they report a swelling or they report irritation around this area, it could be due to that. Next, we're going to consider um, signs of circulation problems by looking at the colour of our patient's hand. So, for example, if there's a significant change in colour between the right and left sides, um, or if there's signs of pallor on the hand as we observe it, we might be looking to see if there's any reduction in circulation, in which case we might want to consider referring our patient to a specialist, a vascular um, specialist, for example. But the other thing to consider is whether or not our patient's pain may be linked to this. So let's say our patient has changes in colour between the right and left sides and they have diffuse general aching around the hand. We could consider whether or not it is a vascular condition causing our patient's symptoms. Again, this would also require quick onward referral for us to a specialist for further investigations and further management. And the last thing we're going to comment on in this video is possible signs of Dupuytren's condition. So what that might look like is where our patient has a cord-like presentation of the tendons going into the palm of the hand. Um, so for example, it's most common in the fourth and fifth fingers to see this presentation. So if you see um, a cord-like presentation of the tendons here, um, or even the presence of what might look like a small nodule, consider the possibility of your patient presenting with early signs of Dupuytren's condition. So next we're going to consider observation of the wrist and the hand in a posterior view and in a second we're going to flip over to a radial view and an ulnar view as well. So let's start with a posterior view. And here, your observation may well take you in directions based on your patient's subjective history. So, for example, if your patient reports pain around um, the uh, radial carpal joint, then you may look at this particular area for redness, swelling and bruising. Or if they report pain along the MCP heads, then you might look for your signs there. So, again, inflammatory signs, redness, swelling, bruising and bony deformity things to consider. Let's say your patient has had a fall, fall onto an outstretched hand, and they report that they haven't had the chance to add an x-ray, and they present with significant swelling or redness around the uh, wrist joint, potential signs of a fracture maybe. But in terms of other specific pathologies to look out for in this view, consider the hand as a whole, but in particular the different joints of the fingers, so the MCP joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints, and the distal interphalangeal joints. So different um, Conditions that may well cause uh, swelling amongst the hand might be osteoarthritis, where you might see a local uh, inflammation of one or two joints. If you see multiple um, joint swelling, um, this may be an indication of, let's say, a rheumatoid arthritis or an other inflammatory pathology such as psoriatic arthritis. And otherwise, other reasons you may develop swelling around different joints may be due to a hypermobility. So why would this make sense? So um, if, let's say, your patient is hypermobile, this might cause different ligaments around that area to become irritated because they're under so much tension because they're really trying to gain more stability in a hand that is hypermobile. And so you may see local irritation 
of swelling as a, re as a result of that. Let's swap over to the radial side. So here, I suppose the main pathology we might be looking at on the radial side would be to Quervin syndrome, which is a tina synovitis of two particular tendons that run in, the, in and around the anatomical snuff box. And those two tendons are the tendons of abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. Now, this may not necessarily present as either redness or bruising or swelling, but it might be a consideration if you see these signs in this area. Otherwise, as we said earlier, um, a fracture, for example, may cause a fracture to the distal radius, may generate swelling or redness in that area. And then if we relax the hand down and consider the ulna uh, aspect uh, or the distal ulna, I suppose the, one of the main things we consider here, like we did on the radial side, is a potential fracture. So if your patient has significant swelling or redness around the distal ulna, is that because they may have had a trauma that has caused a fracture? So to summarise this video on observation of the wrist and the hand. Observe your patient's wrist and hand in an anterior view, a posterior view, a radial and ulnar view as well. Make sure you always compare the affected and unaffected sides. In each view, consider inflammatory signs of redness, swelling and bruising, as well as bony deformity, especially if your patient reports a trauma in relation to their symptoms. You can also look for signs of specific pathology in each view, as we have highlighted during the video. And that completes our video on observation of the wrist and the hand. Next, I'd like to suggest you have a look at our other videos in the wrist catalogue here on Clinical Physio, including palpation of the wrist and the hand. Thank you as always for watching, guys. We'll see you again soon, right here on Clinical Physio.